Hello to all of our listeners and welcome back to The Parent Solution, your one-stop shop for all things educational. I am your host, Kimberly, and today is another amazing guest episode. This episode, I have Dr. Andrew Blackwood speaking here with me today. Dr. Blackwood is a mental health professional, an author, a keynote speaker, and a healing communication parenting coach. For more than 17 years, he's connected deeply with individuals and parents and teens to support their growth and their healing via speaking, coaching, workshops, and his book, The Art of a Genuine Apology, which is definitely on my summer reading list. Dr. Drew's personal journey through anxiety and his childhood divorce helps him appreciate the often painful challenges of those that he had the opportunity to work with. Earning a Master's of Divinity in Counseling and a Doctorate of Ministry in Marriage and Family has really prepared him to serve well as a clinician, a guest expert, and a media consultant. He has been on shows like 100 Huntley Street and the 700 Club Canada. His remarkable ability to engage and bring clarity to the complex challenges of healing in relationships sets him apart as a true facilitator of change. His desire to impact relationship culture around the world is made personal every day as he continues to learn and heal and grow in his most prized relationships with his wife and his two daughters. Dr. Blackwood is on a mission, he says, to help one million Christian parents help their children step out of anxiety and step confidently into their identity and purpose by 2030. Dr. Blackwood, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me, Kimberly. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did did I miss anything in your introduction? No, no, no. It was, I was just like wondering when it was going to end. I'm like, that's a long introduction. Sometimes you listen to introductions and you kind of, you're like, oh, wow, did I do all that stuff? Do I, am I really that amazing? <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me today. Okay. So a couple of questions. I mean, your, your mission to, um, you say empower 1 million Christian parents, um, in their, with, with their relationship with their children. I think that that's really inspiring. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? What what made that your goal and how did that happen? Honestly, one million is just an impressively huge number. And they say it's good to have some specifics, but regardless of the number, I, I just want to see every parent around the world equipped to support their children to do something that is essential, which is to navigate intense emotions. And most of us aren't equipped. So we struggle and we try to fix behaviors, but we very rarely get to the root of the concerns. But God's position does perfectly to be able to do that. So I want to help people to help their children and pass that on instead of some other unhealthy things that we tend to pass on. Right. And to stop the generational traumas, so to speak, and learn to deal with things in a healthy manner. I know that, I know that over the course of the past, like, little while, Emotional well-being has really been a topic of conversation amongst a lot of circles, particularly in like teaching your kids how to do that. How do you go about helping parents? Maybe maybe some strategies that you find or some patterns that you find that are very prevalent in today's society of helping parents navigate and teach their children these sorts of things for their emotional well-being. Certainly. It's very difficult to manage something that you don't understand. So we start there. We start to understand what emotions are, particularly anxiety, because that is the prevailing emotion that most people have struggles with. And that's like often the core of larger emotional as well as mental health conditions and challenges. So we start with anxiety because it's simply a picture of the future that's negative. And when we can help parents to appreciate that, then they can start to recognize, oh, I actually feel anxious when I'm interacting with my child. And the moment they understand that, they feel a little guilty sometimes and a little confused or maybe even even more anxious. But it's actually a blessing in disguise because when we understand it for ourselves, then we can actually Mm. empathize with our children. And as we learn how to deal with it, then they get to see how it's done. And children learn a whole lot more from what they see and experience than what we tell them. So that's where we start. We start by helping parents learn how to be calm. And then we move on to helping them provide a calming experience for their child. Because 
we as children are not born knowing how to navigate our emotions and calm ourselves and tolerate unpleasant experiences. We just react. So right. when, when we provide that understanding for them, we provide that experience for them, then we can move them on into actually addressing what's at the core of whatever is bothering them. So those are three simple steps. Be calm, help them be calm, but then understand what is actually happening. What's the real need there? Mm -hmm. And none of that, none, none of those, in none of those steps, does that require you to, I mean, like get upset or blame either yourself or your child. It's more coming from a perspective of understanding and, and, and creativity in trying to determine how do we solve this problem together rather than this is your fault because you did this or this is my fault because I did this. And instead, it sounds like what you're saying is you're working together towards a solution rather than pointing fingers at each other. Yes, yes, definitely. And I think a lot of the times when we are more reactive, again, it comes from a place of concern, but mm -hmm. then it also comes from a place of really wanting to help their children move quickly through something. Mm -hmm. And there are some unfair and unhealthy expectations that come along with that. Right. We expect our children to do better. We expect them to know better. We expect them to, you know, remember what we told them yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're experiencing intense emotions, most of the times our logical thinking and reasoning is offline, even as adults. So it's important for us to be aware of our expectations as of ourselves and of our kids. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, I know for me, like I always have a million and one things going in my head. It was actually a video I watched and maybe you have some thoughts on this. I think his name, I don't remember his name, but he's a, he's a Christian comedian and he's, is it Bob? I'm not sure if it's Bob. That's going to bother me. I'm going to find out, but he's a Christian comedian and he emphasizes the difference between men's brains and women's brains and how men are consistently like they just deal with things one, one at a time, right? Like they're very much like a one, a one, a one box to, to put it that way sort of mentality, whereas women kind of have things, everything's connected to everything else, which makes a huge difference in how we communicate with each other, but also with our kids. And this is kind of where I'm going with this. I'm not sure if you have any insights in terms of how parents communicate with their children, if you've noticed certain patterns as to how parents communicate either in a healthy way or an unhealthy way with their children, and then how that kind of affects kids in terms of their anxiety level and, and things that they have issues with? You know, I, I know there's a, a lot of study and conversation around brain science and brain differences. And my my take on it is, I, I really do believe there's this idea about neuroplasticity, and mm -hmm. we can train the brain. And I find that, especially with a lot of the parents that I've worked with, there hasn't really been a different, a typical way that women respond to anxiety and crisis than men do when, when it comes to their children. So I see some, I see some women who typically they parent, you know, in a particular way because that's how they were parented. And let's say being dismissive of their children's pain or, mm -hmm. or, fatigued plays, but very dismissive. But then there are some other women who are in the other extreme where nothing gets dismissed and everything gets kind of amplified, right? And then we have the helicopter parenting and then, you know, really over infantilizing. But I see men on both sides of the spectrum too. So when I, when I work with parents, I really focus more on who and how they want to be. I talk a lot about nurturing their nature. So it's important. Good. Yeah. It's important to know who you are because a lot of us have been a certain way all of our lives. And it's important for us to be aware of that and, 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 and govern ourselves accordingly. But the same thing happens with, with our children. We want to know who our children are by nature. Like this is how my child is. So how do I parent this particular child? I have two daughters. They're only three years and change apart. In some ways, they're very similar, but in some ways, they're very different. One is absolutely methodical, and the other one is much more spontaneous. So parenting them 
and responding to their needs is very different. And they're both, they're both girls. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it may not necessarily be a gender thing necessarily, but more along the lines of how you, I mean, obviously as a child, you're not necessarily as capable of, of cognitive sort of thinking through your emotion. The goal is to get yourself there. But as an adult, operating in different crises doesn't necessarily make a difference whether you're male or female. I agree. Yeah, yeah. That is precisely what I'm saying. And the while there may be different strategies that mm. I encourage parents to use and that I use myself, the end goal is actually always the same. Right? right. Where we start is different, but where we go is 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 always the same. And I'm wanting people, parents and children included, to be able to be aware, three things, be aware, increasingly aware of what you're feeling and what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. But then we want to be able to tolerate what we feel, the emotions that we feel. We don't want to be reactive. We want to be able to respond, respond. We want to be response able, right? And that comes from being able to tolerate the discomfort of unpleasant emotions. And then we move on to the third thing we want to increase is intentionality. How do I choose to respond to whatever it is I'm facing, whatever it is I'm feeling? I want it to be a choice and not, not a reaction. So that is, is relevant for men, women, boys, girls. I believe that is the way that we, you know, will live our best lives with intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, I really resonate and, and I'm sure most of our listeners do as well with the idea of tolerating certain emotions and being able to sit in the discomfort and man that is such a powerful phrase like being able to sit in the discomfort of negative emotion not to react to them not to or overly over exaggerate them but to recognize hey this is what i'm feeling right now um how do i tolerate this how do i manage this in a healthy way does that mean that i need to sit with myself for half an hour does that mean i need to do some writing does that mean i need to go and do a workout I mean, I need to go and be around people, right? I'm sure that there's different things that people do that are different coping mechanisms. And hopefully the idea being that they're healthy coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I encourage parents and children to label emotions as pleasant or unpleasant as opposed mm. to negative or positive. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. The, the reason for that is when we see something as negative, mm -hmm. we try to avoid it. True. Just because it's unpleasant doesn't mean that it's bad. Emotions are always communicating something to us. And sometimes it fits the scenario, fits the, the context appropriately, and it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable and we want to live there. For example, if, if you've experienced a loss and you're grieving, it's not comfortable, but there's growth in grieving. There's mm -hmm. life after loss, whether it's you've lost something or someone. It's important to go through that process. And if we see it as negative, then we push it away and we don't engage. You know, right. even an emotion as powerful as anger, which can be used to really hurt people. Anger is not a negative emotion. It's not bad. There are many situations where anger is appropriate and it's healthy and it activates us. It helps to keep us safe. When we, when we allow it to govern our lives, we know that it doesn't, you know, work the, the righteousness of God. It doesn't, it doesn't please him because then it's ruling our lives. But mm -hmm. if we don't experience anger and are able to, to be intentional with it, then again, we do one of those polar things, either it runs our lives or we run away from it and we avoid it. And that's not healthy. Right. Right. And so I'm interested that you were talking about anxiety. So then you wouldn't label that per se as a negative emotion. You'd label it as an unpleasant emotion. Right. And I, know, I know you were saying, and I would definitely agree with you in my teaching experience and and the experience that I've had dealing with children and, and even, even in just an educational sense with students, anxiety is, is through the roof in kids. And I mean, I don't remember, I'm not that old and like, I don't remember growing up being an anxious kid. I, I thought a lot and I definitely am an overthinker, 
but I wasn't anxious like I see in a lot of kids today. And I know that's a really prevalent concern. And and I know that you mentioned that earlier, that that's something that has really been on the rise. Is there, are there, is there a cause to that? Is it kind of just the way our world is? And where is that coming from? Yes. And very rarely would I say that there's one cause. I think there are many contributing factors. Mm-hmm. So I mentioned nature and nurture. And here's an example of how they come together. Because by nature, I came into the world pretty much wired the way that I was, which was huh. prone to anxiety. And I can see at, now that I'm older and I look back at how my parents parented me, I can see that they were anxious too. And that contributed to my own anxiety through the language that they used and the style of parenting, which was partially cultural. My parents mm-hmm. come from Jamaica and they are very direct, borderline assertive, aggressive people in general. Yeah. So the, the, the <laughs> tones, the language, it's, you know, and I, by nature, I'm a very sensitive person. But, and and I'll give you an example. And what I'm talking about when I say nature versus nurture, I remember when I transitioned from grade two to grade three, this was a series of events. So I was going from a regular program to a gifted program. So I had the, the, the mental capacity and the academic skill to move from a general class to a much more advanced class. Mm -hmm. But we also moved from one part of town to another part of town. So Mm -hmm. I moved homes, but then culturally or the demographic was different. I moved from a school where there were three white children in the school to a school where there were three black children in the school. So there was a lot of change happening and I was stressed. But not only was I stressed, I, stress triggered anxiety for me. So the teacher asked the question and she asked questions every day in the circle. And she said, you know, okay, so what's your favorite number? Kimberly, when she was going around to other people, I was just like, favorite number, favorite number, favorite number. Oh my God, I don't have a favorite number. What's my favorite number? What's my favorite number? What's my number? Because I, right? The question is, what is your favorite number? So I assume you have to have a favorite number. So yeah. I'm like, okay, let me just pick five. So I picked five and I was like, whew. Okay. But then here's where you see the nature. I was like, okay, well, what do you do with a favorite number? And I'm like, oh, Bye. okay. So I guess I'm supposed to use this favorite number. So I started doing things with that number. Like I would try to take five steps from here to there, but then that didn't feel right. So I would make it balanced and I would take 10 steps because 10 steps just felt better. I'd take five sips, but then I'd have to take 10 sips because that do you, do you see the OCD ish compulsive yes, kind of? For yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Nobody, nobody taught that to me. I didn't observe that. That was just wired into who I was. Mm-hmm. And when a certain level of stress happens, this way of thinking and, 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 and functioning comes out. So knowing this about myself now. <laughs> I can navigate that. I can manage the stress in my life and I can actually, because I understand how the thinking works. I understand what the compulsion does for me that I can be intentional with that. Mm -hmm. So it's so important for us to understand how we parent and what our kids are experiencing so that we can support them and nurture their nature. Right, right. And that, that, I mean, thank you for sharing that story. It's funny because when you think about just a, such a simple question and you have trouble answering it, but then your automatic thought is, well, well, why is that my favorite number? For me, I've always been a why person, right? I've always been someone that has to ask why for absolutely everything. <laughs> and the end that had a lot to do with how my parents brought me up, my father, especially. And I incorporate that in a lot of life practices as well as business practices. I I need to have a reason why for everything to the point that sometimes it is detrimental, right? Sometimes you don't need to know the answer why for everything. You don't have to have a reason all the time. I'm still working on that one, personal growth, right? (laughs) But it brings up that that, uh, conversation around just that, around conversation and communication, right? 
and how important that is between a child and their parent and and that healthy level of communication so that those emotions can be handled in a positive manner or in sorry in a in a not in a positive manner in a in a influential manner yeah yeah and i and i think there is positive parenting for sure the emotion might be unpleasant but our response that's what we can be intentional and positive about Mm-hmm. So, yeah, all of our traits, they're double-sided coins. They can really work well for us or they can, you know, be our Achilles heel at the same time. So it's so important for us to know ourselves and know our children really, really well. Mm-hmm. And you brought up the point, too, and this, this kind of leads to to another interrelated point of children being able to mimic what they see rather than what they're told. So modeling healthy relationships and modeling healthy ways of handling your emotions to your children, I know is also a really big driving point with you and and how you support parents. Yes, yes. Each week I meet with parents on Thursday nights at eight and we walk and talk ourselves through how we respond to our children from a place of peace. And I teach people what I call the parental peace framework. And, you know, one of the biggest things, again, it's a blessed burden, is when we mess up, when we do things the wrong way or when we hurt our kids, Mm -hmm. because it gives us the opportunity to address emotional injury. And most people might know what to do if you fall and scrape yourself or if you break an arm. We know how to respond to those things or we know how to go and get help. But when it comes to emotional injury, most of us aren't prepared and we're not equipped. We don't have that emotional first aid and we don't come back and revisit things and bring healing to those unseen wounds. Mm -hmm. And that's what we learn how to do. And it's remarkable how well children respond to parents when they address something with humility with empathy, when they be, when they're vulnerable, when they're responsible, and when they're accountable. These are five values that are woven into what I call the art of a genuine apology. And I teach people this through the book, but I also talk it through with them in the course, because especially when we're dealing with anxiety, the one thing that's worse than feeling anxious is feeling alone or ashamed because you're feeling anxious. And when we dismiss our children's concerns or we have expectations that are just unrealistic and unfair for them, it wounds them. So Mm -hmm. it makes learning difficult, learning socially, learning at home, learning wherever they are, it becomes an impediment. So when we learn how to address this and we bring healing to our children, it's, it's, it's like re setting bones. So now that, that disruption and growth, it's been repaired and that child can grow. But if we don't, it's like emotional trauma presses pause on our development emotionally. Mm-hmm. So whether it's us or our parents, you can see that people, when they are reactive, they're not behaving in keeping with their chronological age. You might look at somebody who's like 60 and be like, why are you behaving like you're seven? That's because they had some emotional injury that was never addressed. Mm -hmm. So now that I know this and now that parents know this, we can help our kids grow holistically, comprehensively and mature appropriately when they experience hardship and challenge, which they will again and again. So it's essential, I believe, for every parent to know how to do this and to do it well for themselves, their their relationships, their adult relationships, their working relationships, but especially with their children. Mm-hmm. Because the goal, I mean, I would assume the, the goal that every parent has or that most parents have would be to equip their children for future success. No parent comes that like gives birth to a child become no parent becomes a parent however that that journey looks like no parent becomes a parent i would hope with the intentions of not serving that child to the best of their ability 
and to the best service that that child needs, right? Every child needs different things, of course, but there's some general basic guidelines. And I think this conversation around emotional growth and emotional intelligence and emotional parenting in a correct manner is a really important one to have because it doesn't mean that you, you know, it doesn't mean that people have been doing it all wrong and, you know, there's only one right way to parent. No, but this mentality of, you know, the parent is always right and the, the child always has to listen and there's no engagement, there's no discourse, there's no, well, this is why we follow those rules. There's no, well, this is this is what makes sense to us. Do you see how that makes sense to you? No? Okay, let's talk about it, right? Having a discourse around things, and that again kind of comes back to communication, is huge. And I just would briefly like to touch on your book as well that I know you've written, The Art of a Genuine Apology. Like I said, I've not re- I've not read it yet, but it's definitely on my summer reading list because I think that oftentimes, and I see this all the time, oftentimes parents feel as though if they apologize to their child, it's like they're admitting that they were wrong and that's not allowed because as a parent, you always have to have it perfect. And like, I'm not an expert, but I would say you don't have to have it perfect. You, your child just has to know you're there. Yes, yes. So there, there's so many aspects of this needing to have it right piece. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't just apply to parenting. I know we're talking about it in the, the context of parenting, but there's actually a strong connection here between that all or nothing way of thinking and anxiety. We might not see it as readily, but it's there. So. Mm-hmm. There are these thought patterns that wreak havoc in our lives, and it's not just in the area of parenting. If you think this way in parenting, you're likely going to think this way in other areas of your life. If you have a problem with admitting that you're wrong, there's this expectation and there's meaning to that. So I have to get it right, because if I don't get it right, what does that mean? Well, it could mean a number of things. It means I have an expectation to get it right. And if I don't get it right, that means I'm not a good parent. That means I'm not a smart person. Or that means my child has more authority in the relationship than I do. These are all wrong beliefs, but they all fall under that same category of all or nothing thinking, which means I have to get it right, which means I have to be domineering over my child. And it informs the way that we parent and it informs the way that we, that we live. And it creates bitterness, resentment, and fear in that relationship. And most people don't see that. They think that they're trying, they think that they're, they're safeguarding their children by telling them what to do and how to do it all the time. But I talk with parents about in, in week three of the program, we talk about assessing risk and harm as a way to help moderate our children, our our parenting and our our approach. And Mm -hmm. if we address our children consistently and perpetually as if the risk to their choices and their behaviors are high, like you're going to die if you keep doing this, then we end up taking control. We end up jumping in and over-functioning and doing way too much. Yeah. Right. So there are moments where, by all means, it is important. If my child is running into the street and there's oncoming traffic, I'm not going to be suggestive. I'm not going to be gentle. And be, you That's might not a suggestion. Me. Yeah. No, I'm going to run in and grab her and save her life. Whereas right. if she's doing something in the house that's not dangerous and it's just annoying to me, I get to manage my own stuff right. and not just yell and, and lose it as I, I, as I used to in the past, mm-hmm. but I get to be more reflective and, and, and gentle and, and patient in my mm-hmm. approach, you know? So yeah, that, that the idea that I have to have it right is a larger discussion mm-hmm. that is really, really important for us to look at because again, we're feeding these things to our children in the culture of our family and mm-hmm. then they pick up on it and then they become that way. And then we wonder why, why does my child right. never listen to me? Right. Right. And then, well, and then not only that, but you end up with adults who feel the same way, as you said, and that's a really good phrase. You press the pause on the emotional development because something happened that 
that they didn't deal with when they were younger. Not that that's necessarily their fault, but for whatever reason, there was no closure provided. There was no nothing that was worked through. And I mean, I'm not saying that therapy has to be the answer for everything. I do think that it's a good idea in a lot of cases because it helps to be able to understand where you're coming from and and why you might think that way, right? And, And what those sorts of triggers are. But the point stands is if you don't deal with those things, you're passing on that stuff, those whatever it is, expectations, anxiety, whatever, to your children who are then going to continue the pattern. And and this brings us full circle to a question that you asked earlier. What's going on with the rise of anxiety? Mm-hmm. A passed down and compounded generational transmission. So if my dad and my mom don't deal well with anxiety, it loads even higher for me. Yes. And if I don't deal with it, it gets bigger for my both genetically, but also socially and environmentally and emotionally. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that, then we have that happening in so many different parts and families in the world, in our community. And we're seeing this, we're seeing all these other larger concerning things in the news and happening around the world. These are real events, but they are just additional factors that are contributing to this right. already multi-generational tran- transmission, right? So mm-hmm. we get to be responsive and aware and address all of these things. And we can do that. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a, there's a, and I, it's not, I, I don't necessarily know what the exact quote is, but there is a, a, a quote that says something to the effect of, you know, I, I, you are made up of your generation, right? Like the stuff that's been passed down to you, like you were just talking about all the good stuff, all the bad stuff. You have had these things happen. Your parents have had these things happen. Your grandparents have had these things happen. You at any point, can decide that you're done with the cycle and you can change it, but you have to want to change it. Yes. And I agree. And, you know, there's desire for change. And then there are those three things that we talked about earlier. Awareness. Mm -hmm. You cannot change something that you're not aware of. Right. Two, tolerance. When you become aware of it, are you going to run? Are you going to react? Or are you going to learn to be intentional and respond? And and I, I think that's a formula for therapeutic engagement, regardless of who you're talking to, whether it's a, a formal relationship where you're seeing a clinician or a coach or a mentor, or if you're just talking to your parents or to your children or to your family, or if you're journaling. That's where I hone this craft for myself. I right. journal multiple mm-hmm. times a day. And uh, I move through that process. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? And how do I want to respond to this? How do I want to deal with this? Mm-hmm. And it makes a difference when we can be intentional. I love that. I love that. The intentionality it sounds like a pretty, I mean, it sounds pretty simple. It's probably <laughs> harder to implement. I know from personal experience, it can be really hard sometimes when you're struggling, particularly when you're struggling with really strong emotions, like you said, anger, right? A, g- a good practice that I have found for me is to, okay, I need to, I literally take a step back. I need to just process, like count, like people say it's silly, but counting to 10. Sometimes I only really have to count to five. And then I might need to respond in some way. Okay, I need to think about this. Can you give me a second to process? I'll come back to it, right? But that's that's a healthy method of of communication as opposed to just having an explosion and then then what have you done and then you have to take the proper steps to rectify that right yeah yeah you end up taking more steps if you even choose to take those steps right so again okay. you're you you've learned how to nurture your nature care for yourself in a way that helps you to be responsible And mature. And I think sometimes we aren't humble enough or we're so fearful of our own weaknesses and our own imperfections that we don't acknowledge what we need in the moment. Mm -hmm. If you, if, if you are benefited by counting, count (laughs) and do so. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you know, but 
people expect themselves to just deal naturally and easily with things that are challenging. I remember mm-hmm. when we had ki- when we first had kids and life changed for us. Sleep deprivation is a thing. Okay. Right. Like if you're not rested, you're not sleeping well, you are not going to be the best version of yourself. So it's important for us to be aware of the factors that contribute to us losing it. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a man and I know I talked earlier about men's brains and, 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 and female brains and, you know, science and discussions about that. But I know one of the things that's really important for a lot of men is being able to be strong and to provide where we're, we're socialized, we're groomed to like do everything by ourselves and you got to right. have all the answers and nobody could question you and, and those kinds of right. things. Right. Yes. And let me tell you that expectation being the perfect parent, it isn't, doesn't just happen with women. It happens with men too. And the shame that comes over you when you aren't able to do what you expect to do for your children, it's, it's, it's really, really hard to deal with, but important to deal with because that's right. where we grow. That's where we grow. So I know about myself, if I don't get enough rest, I am not going to parent as well as I want to. And as much as I might want to accomplish everything on my list and make all of these changes in my business, and I'm just like, the expectation to get it all done yesterday and parent perfectly is just not possible. Right. So... I can, I can walk that back and I can be grateful for what I've done today, what I've experienced today and still have enough bandwidth for my kids. And when I don't, I can let them know. Right. Let them know that is, that is feeling really worn today. So you're asking me five questions back to back. Now time for questions. Let's right. save the questions till tomorrow. So I, 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 I walk and talk myself through situations with my kids and I nurture my nature. <laughs> like it's just not, a, it's not a good moment. Not the, a good moment. The, the educator in me wants to say like, tell your kids to write them down, right? Because then they're practicing their writing skills. So many kids these days, I will tell you, <laughs> so many kids these days don't have the proper literacy skills, not necessarily saying yours. I'm just saying in general, I always am a proponent and an advocate for like writing stuff, right? So just a little bit of humor there, but oh, I, I, yeah, I yeah. love it. I love it. I will, I will use that one. <laughs> <laughs> write it down. Yeah, right write it down. One more time in swimmer space. <laughs> I want you to, this, your question is important. I want you to yes. remember. Uh, yeah. Please get a pen and paper and write it down and we can come back to it tomorrow. I love it. Right. Questions for daddy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. They can practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Before we close out this podcast, tell our listeners where they can find you and and where kind of things are and, and how they can get in touch with you if they want more information. Certainly. CoachDrew.ca is my website and you can always reach me. There are links there so that you can even schedule a 30-minute free consultation. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, CoachDrewCan is my handle, all one word. And yeah. That's the best way to reach me. Awesome. Awesome. Very nice. And for those of you who are listeners of The Parent Solution, you know that upon publication of this podcast, the blog that dropped yesterday on our website also has all of the links. So if you head to www.starstudents.co, not .com, .co, then you will see the partner blog that will have all of Dr. Andrew's info as well. So that's another way you can reach him. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for your time and your energy. I really appreciate you taking the uh, the time out today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.